Hey everyone, you have landed on The Substance. I'm your host, Philip Marinello, welcoming you back. Uh, we got a very special replay episode for you here today. Uh, and I, I, I do want to take uh, some responsibility and apologize for some of the spotty releases. The plan was to have replays every week until we get our new launch plan going, but uh, straight up, it's hard. Um, and some of you that followed me on social media saw that last week I had a wonderful trip with my family. I uh, went and visited with Trevor, got to hang out with his new baby boy and see him and his wife and his girls and my wife and our boys. They spent a lot of time in the pool. We went to go do some cool stuff. Uh, so that was a lot of fun, but I didn't get a darn thing done podcast wise while I was there other than maybe potentially schedule and play in future episodes, but that doesn't help me get these replays out. So thank you for your patience. Um, if you are a newer listener and haven't heard this one yet, whether you're a new or old listener, this is a great one. Uh, substantive cinema is a format that is very dear to my heart. Um, maybe see more on that here in the future, but um, this was one of the few episodes actually where the movie that we were covering for the show is not one that was like a deep, deep favorite of mine for a long time before we did this episode. I actually watched this movie um, for this episode, maybe maybe slightly before, but I this was not a movie that I had a long history with. I knew that uh, Tyler Huckabee was somebody I want to have on, really appreciate his insight and his platform and his writing and his thoughts. So I was like, hey, come on, like what could I offer Tyler? that would make it easier for him to say yes. So I was like, okay, let's get some David Lynch. Um, and the straight story was just one that seemed so odd in his filmography. But actually, um, it ended up kind of unlocking a lot of David Lynch's filmography for me. So this is one of my favorite Lynch films. It's kind of hard to say um, which one's my actual favorite because the man is genuinely in a league of his own. And over the last several years, he's uh, a director and just a, an artist whose work I appreciate much, much more. And I imagine that you will see uh, more of his work uh, potentially in the future on the show. Um, so all that to say, got a great show for you here. Replay uh, the straight story with Tyler Huckabee still streaming on Disney plus a gorgeous version. And it looks like word on the digital streets are that um, maybe having a criterion or another big boutique label 4k. I know overseas, um, there, I believe there are French and German straight story 4Ks that are doing very well. Um, past guest in front of the show, Elliot Cohen, uh, recently put up a review of the uh, one of the European 4Ks, and it sounds great, and it looks like we'll probably be getting one stateside here uh, before too long. And as always, um, your support means everything to us. If you share the show, uh, take a minute. If you haven't already, uh, you don't even need to pause the show. Just open up the app if you're listening on Spotify or Apple hit the five-star button, write a sentence or two for us. It means the world to us. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Tyler Huckabee on David Lynch's The Straight Story. Where's your family? Are you running away? How far along are you? Five months. that I'm heading to see my brother Lyle. My family hates me. They'll really hate me when they find out. They may be mad, but I don't think they're mad enough to want to lose you or your little problem. I don't know about that. Well, of course, neither do I, but... Uh, Warm bed and a roof sounds a mite better than eating a hot dog on a stick with an old geezer that's traveling on a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> when my kids were real little, I used to play a game with them. I'd give each one of them a stick and one for each one of them. And I'd say, you break that. Of course they could, real easy. Then I'd say, tie them sticks in a bundle and try to break that. Of course, they couldn't. Then I'd say, that bundle, that's family.
Dependent on the Substance, a podcast aimed at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us each week as we engage the culture without the culture war. I'm your host, Trevor Aiken. I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Philip Marinello. Hey, everybody. And Vincent Edwards. Yo, yo. Yo, what's good tonight, y'all? Pretty good. Excited to talk movies again, man. Yeah, yeah. we're back for some movies. We're back. More this the movies. We're doing it. This is like I, I feel like this podcast makes up like eighty percent of Trevor's movie watching annually. At least, at least that much. <laughs> I mean, you got like, kids now, number. but I mean, if you're not cranking like Frozen or Encanto, I feel like it's pretty much just substance movies. I regularly get to like Tuesday, and it's like, all right, hey Christina, that's my wife. I'm like. Hey, I I gotta watch this movie for the substance tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then so, he'll like, text me afterwards. Hey, man, you want to send me some reviews or stuff so that I can like read about this? <laughs> so I, like, understand this? What? Why am I watching this film? Oh man. So yeah, that's that's me in movies, as as you might know. But if not, welcome back. Um, we also would like to welcome to the show our guest for today, Tyler Huckabee from Relevant. Welcome, Tyler. Hey, it's good to be here, guys. Howdy. Is it Relevant Media Company now or Relevant? Well, well, it's it's always been Relevant Media Company is like the, you know, the company relevant that owns annual the magazine? website, the magazine, the the podcast, all of that. That's the umbrella. Relevant Media Company is the meta to Relevant Magazine's Facebook. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> this, if that, if that helps yeah, you know? Yeah. You guys like you that analogy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is good to be here. I'm excited to be excited. I'm nervous. I get a little nervous at the top of podcasts sometimes. Oh, so wow. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah on, we could be a bunch yeah, of weirdos, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like yeah, I, I didn't write it down. I, I took a little bit of notes. I feel like I, I, I do some homework sometimes when we have guests on. What's, uh, what's your Enneagram number again, Tyler? Whoa! Oh, wow! Jumping right in there. deep. Wow. <laughs> so I'm a, so I'm a nine. I'm an Enneagram okay. nine. I'm the peacemaker. Oh, what up? Mm. Oh, yeah. Fellow nine yeah, and nine fellow represent. nines. Yeah, represent. Okay. There you right. go. Right on. Right on. Well, that must be a very. And I rarely feel nervous. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is in seven. My my wife, so I, I'm I'm comfortable with with sevens. But I I know I, uh, I'm surprised I, that sevens can uh, because because sevens uh, I feel like sitting behind a mic for an hour just talking <laughs> that would not be a lot of sevens. Like I do have a really good <laughs> talking uh, what is about it, stuff I'm night. interested in. I'm, yeah, I'm I guess, here for yeah, it. Yeah, sure, See, that's sure. the thing because because we're a Christian variety show, so we've got there is something. Back to Trevor. Introduce the show, things. Trevor, to, to yeah. our new listeners who yeah. have uh, come over from relevant. Because that's the, introduce that's the, the show. Thing. Skip that. All sorts of different things Very about the show. Very professional yeah. podcast here. Trevor. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, I, I my thing is segues, right? Because the nine see the connectedness of all things. So. <laughs> Oh man, I never <laughs> thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we talk about stuff in Christianity, culture, the arts. We have guests on. You can see our catalog. We've had Karen Swallow Pryor. We've had Jamar Tiz. We've had a number of folks. Um, way too many to shout them all out. And then a lot of times we chop it up among ourselves. Great guests like Tyler here tonight. You had Jamar and Karen on. Yeah, and you guys oh, yeah. really have fallen off a cliff with this recent guest. This is <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. We've had your <laughs> collaborator propaganda on. He was oh yeah, Prop episode oh, was shot to the top five when he came yes. on. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Prop, really prop is just is just grease for just grease on the roller coaster wheels. That guy can <laughs> if your if your podcast doesn't go to the top five with him on it, time to find the new lane. Your <laughs> yeah, podcast right. yeah, such an incredible lane. podcast already that if that doesn't yeah, like yeah, yeah, I guess that's a that, <laughs> yeah. there you go. I like I like that. Well, one day so you'll maybe have that work. problem. That's an aspirational problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at the end of our show or one segment, we'll do some shout outs that our guests have been finding enjoyable. So welcome to everybody uh, to The Substance. And uh, as you can see, when you clicked on it this time, uh, we're cinema. doing a... Say what? It's a Substantive Cinema. Substantive Cinema. Let's one of my favorites. There. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I promise, Definitely. Vince, one day we're, we're going to get back to the, <laughs> the blockbuster, populist, <laughs> <laughs> like move in kind of movie we'll do another one of, <laughs> one of these days Vince, are you more of like uh are you more of like a like a, a summer movie guy like a popcorn movie guy uh i i guess if you want to describe it like no that shade. I, no shade no i i, I, I have I'm literally I'm no them. shame in the things that i like um and I, it's not to say that i don't like a, a little more like a mellow tempo or something a little that's older it's just it's it's got to really capture me in order for me to be like Man, this was a great movie. <laughs> but 
most of the time I like stuff like I know action movies or horror movies that were recently made that could be very substantive. For so sure. Just it's 100%. just one of those things. Yeah. We we had Eugene on. We talked Matrix Resurrections. We'll, yeah, for we'll sure. get back to the more exciting stuff soon. <laughs> Which I liked. I, I, I know I feel like I that was a hot take. That. I was a fan yeah. of Resurrections. I want to give you one yes. or two minutes. Whenever we have a movie person on, I had no expectations. I was blown away. I'd love to hear like a 60 second Matrix Resurrections take from we're, you. We're very, pro. you know, yeah. I, I feel I, I feel bad because I thought this would be like a really like I finished it and I liked it, and then I fielded multiple texts from friends who tipped me up and were like, "How did that movie end up so bad? Like, what? Where did know, they go right? wrong?" I could, and I and yeah. I really don't know what they're talking about because yeah. I thought it was such a smart. One thing I, I really respect about what, what the Wachowskis have always done, and what Lana did with this one, is they do not care what people expect Love from it. their movies and are, yes. are so willing to follow their own, and in this case, her own uh, course and like make the kind of statement they want to make. Mm-hmm. People would have obviously eaten up another movie full of of just like the, the hallway scene in the first Matrix with guns sure, going sure. through that. And, sure. and she refused to give that to them, and I really, really admire that. I, yes. I think I had some quibbles about, obviously the action was not up to the, like, the completely revolutionary action sure. sequences of the first Matrix sure. movie. Which COVID is and no Genro Ping this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's fit, it, That's a fair critique. But as far as the story goes, as far yeah. as the I thought the design, the visuals, uh, Keanu and Carrie Ann's chemistry mm. and, and performances, I I really, really loved it. And Jessica Henwick, man, that, that woman is a star. Like, I can't, I want Huge her to be fan in of her. movie. And anything yeah. she's in now, I'm I'm on it. Yeah, she's she's, she's do great she things. saved Iron Fist from being completely unwatchable, and I'm glad <laughs> she got through that train wreck and is now like getting actually good roles and making her own career. It's cool and yes. perfectly in like a, a heady action sci-fi legacy movie. She perfectly nailed the uh, the what's up doc line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no mean feat because there's a lot of there's a lot of like uh, layers to that line yeah. in a movie like in a franchise like The Matrix. Uh, but I thought it was great, and I want to I do want to clarify to. Vince, I love dumb summer movies. I'm a fiend for the MCU and and, oh, yeah. and rep that for for I, I I love it. I love it. And I, I defended Eternals when everybody else was Mitchell, knocking on Eternals. The, no, I haven't seen Black Widow. Black Widow and Eternals I still need to see. So yeah, I, yeah. Eternals uh, was I, pretty I love them. Yeah, and Turtles was it was it was a little underwhelming, but it wasn't bad. Okay. I definitely wouldn't put it in the bad category. Black okay. Widow was was also underwhelming, and like they need to try like to do something from all these movies like to make them better. Yeah, and so and, and, and I get it though. She doesn't have any powers. She's not coming from a different world. There's no really history or context outside of this camp that you know uh, she she comes from and her sister and stuff. So it's like. And there were some funny moments in it. So it, it wasn't like an unenjoyable movie more than it was just like, okay, y'all, y'all did a movie. I appreciate Didn't it. the highs that we know this franchise is capable exactly. of. And, uh, and, and I think that you're, it's, I think I understand why people were dis- disappointed by it. I'm surprised that Eternals was the first movie that like got a net get, like got a rotten tomato a rotten rating oh, on rotten no. tomatoes wow. so i think there are way worse mcu movies than eternals like, like they, have some, they have some air balls for sure and i just didn't think it Etern- i didn't think eternals was a slam dunk <laughs> but i didn't think it was a total miss right and i was very bummed i missed um the last three i haven't seen in the theater i was really bummed i missed uh shang chi that had some very impressive Ooh, that, was good. Oh, that was fun yeah that was, that that was, was good, good. you're gonna i like have that you movie. seen it phil Oh yeah, I but I saw it at home it's on not Disney in Plus. Theaters, oh, yeah. not in theaters. Gotcha. The, I haven't seen any of the new ones in theaters, and then I still need to catch Black Widow and Eternals. But they're two God. hours and forty five minutes, and when am I going to do that? That's awesome. I'll tell you That's a great a, a great time. film to catch at home on Disney Plus was The Street Story. So yeah, oh, I was going to say I was going to take it back to Vince's <laughs> The very old movie on here today is from nineteen ninety nine. Uh, spoiler yes. alert! Yeah, it, it, we're gonna have spoilers. It's, so it's if you not didn't an IMAX this. film. It's not an IMAX film. I would love to see yeah. this movie in a theater. I would, I would love do. to see this in a theater. Yeah. It did a sixteen um, millimeter run a while back, and and I really wish I would have been able to see it. Like they they really? sent a sixteen mil out to theaters, and, and I was not able to catch it. But that would have been really cool. Maybe yeah. we can. There rally. are some Midwesty scenes in there that like are really pretty nice. 
And on Disney uh, Plus uh, also, uh, kind of get right into it here. I wanna, I'll give some background on the movie in a second. It looked incredible, especially at the beginning. I was mm-hmm. like, is this like a 4K restoration? Like, And even on my like very modest TV, just the opening with the stars and then like the fields, it just looked incredible. Mm-hmm. I thought so too. Okay. I just, I was just rewatched it. I had, a, I had not seen it since I was in college. I had to watch it for a class in college. Oh, wow. And I, re, I rewatched it ahead of this when I knew we were talking about it and had not seen it since then. And I agree. I, I thought it, I thought it really, I was surprised because Disney Plus, not really known for its cinematic restoration uh, streaming service. That's not, I don't think that's what people go, it's not why film heads are going to Disney Plus. But I thought it really delivered on that front. It was really good. Yeah, Hunter. For, so, actually, you mentioned you hadn't seen it in a while. Little detour here again at the beginning. So, David Lynch, I feel like the reason I asked you to be on this one, Tyler, I, like I've seen you a lot. Like we've interacted here and there. Mm-hmm. I didn't know if you'd even remember me, but like on comics and film and stuff. And I feel like I've seen you talk about David Lynch. Maybe you're talking mm-hmm. the new Twin Peaks with somebody. I don't know, but I was like, oh, like this would be because I, I saw this movie for the first time in January. With some of my okay. uh, friends, we have a remote film club that we started when the pandemic hit, and we finally got to this, and I was like, I, I'm not a big David Lynch guy. I, I respect him immensely as an artist, but I feel like maybe 20% of his stuff has landed with me. He's a hard one, man. <laughs> so he's a, he's a, talk to me a little bit. Are you, you're a fan, right? I am. Yeah, I'm a fan of David Lynch, but I, I it, he's one of those where... I understand why you wouldn't be a fan of David. Like he's, he's a very, very divisive, very much not everybody's cup of tea, probably more than any major American filmmaker working mm. right now. So my, my David Lynch story, <laughs> this is a little bit uh, maybe embarrassing to admit on a podcast like this, but the first time I watched a David Lynch movie was in high school because I had heard through the high school boy pipeline that Mulholland Drive had a very salacious scene in it. Sure. And I was weak and the, the, uh, the and wayward in my youth. And, and I, <laughs> and I waited until my parents were out of town and used my, my fake like 18 plus uh, blockbuster get card to go get rent one. And if my parents listen to this now, they know that happened, but they, <laughs> <laughs> I got it. So I rented it and I watched it at home. And uh, and there is a very salacious scene in that, but it is really not what you leave Mulholland Drive thinking about because that is maybe as close to pure a pure horror movie as Lynch has gotten. Although he he certainly has elements of horror in most of his movies, mm. it's it's a very very disturbing movie. And if you are 16 years old and thinking you're going to watch a very horny movie, you are in for a very strange surprise. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> would not be able to relate to that. It changed movie. I it it changed well. your relationship with cinema forever. <laughs> it did, it did, it did, but it really, really, in a in a great way. Like it really, like I left thinking like. I got. I've never because I'd never seen a movie like that that really insane. that leaned it's so far movie. into surrealism and, and so and it was so bizarre. And what I now know to be Lynch trademarks, but I was a homeschooled sixteen year old kid in rural Nebraska. I had no idea who David Lynch was. Oh, mm. It was probably a very titillating rental. It then. was different. Yeah, it was different. But I but I I hopped on our, our old like our, our the family computer and was like it was one of the first times I remember going onto the internet to look up what are people saying about this movie and what are the interpretations of it there out there? Boards. Yeah, I think I'm sure it was the IMDb Love message days. boards or Zanga or I don't know what I was like looking <laughs> through. I don't, who knows <laughs> where where the, the internet took me at that time, but I was really fascinated by it. And, uh, and then later on when I went to college, I went to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago and started right. watching more of his movies. Uh, and that's where I get, watched The Elephant Man and Blue Velvet, uh, Elephant Lost Man. Highway. Uh, started catching up on Twin Peaks, which I had not seen when it was actually on. My parents weren't Twin Peaks fans, but but uh, but I watched it there. And then the Straight Story, which um, <laughs> which is what we're here to, to talk about. Yeah. Well, and that's why I want to set it up too. Like all the things Tyler said, David Lynch is known as a very dark. He said surreal. I feel like dark surrealism is really like those yeah. are the two main words that are associated mm. with Lynch. Like he's very well regarded. It's, his movies are like a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is like being in a, a world of dream logic for a lot of his movies, where things don't necessarily follow a straightforward <sighs> narrative, or they are, and then all of a sudden they're not. And you thought you were watching one kind of movie, and it turns out to be a different kind of movie. As I discovered when I was sixteen years old, like I said, and like it, very strange and inexpl- like. He does the thing that I I love where he doesn't hold your hand, but some of the jumps are so enormous that like 
I'm, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people there, get lost. Multiple times, and I was thinking this the other day because I was rewatching Twin Peaks, and uh, and I got to the very famous scene, uh, episode three or four, I can't remember, of Twin Peaks, where uh, where we, we are introduced to the Red Room, where yeah. people are speaking backwards, and and it's very odd. And my feeling was, I don't know where else I could feel an emotion like this. Like whatever I'm feeling right now, I don't know if there's a word for it, but uh, other than I suppose Lynchian, which is kind of just been introduced into the American vocabulary as a way to talk about strange, surreal things that you Mm -hmm. see. And the straight story sits in a really interesting place alongside that. It does. The rest of that filmography. Right in between yeah. The Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive is The Straight Story, <laughs> the right. G-rated Disney film about a very wholesome old man. Yeah. Just uh, a straight about, about the sweetest story. guy. Uh, yeah. It's a, so, so, yeah, that, that's, I think there, I think, and we, I don't know how long I'm going to talk about this, but my feeling on The Straight Story is that I think on the surface, it feels very outside of the rest of Lynch's work because it's G rated and it is very pure and very tender, um, very bittersweet. I, I'd say it's a pretty sad movie, um, mm. but, but so lovingly uh, so handled. Yeah. Such a, and for, like I said, I grew up in rural Nebraska. I, I grew up about five hours from Iowa where this, where the story starts there. And uh, I really, really recognize so many filmmakers try to capture that sense of the rural Midwest, small town Midwest. And it usually just rings a little bit hollow to me. Um, but, mm. but the straight story does not. It feels very authentic and very true because it's a, it's a true story mm-hmm. uh, that, if I remember right, was filmed in order of uh, of like because the scenes were filmed yeah, in order right. they happened and filmed on location where the actual stories all took place and i think lynch called it his most experimental movie which is maybe a little bit tongue-in-cheek <laughs> if you've seen things like a razor head but all, in many ways i think it's very true and, and i think the more you think about the move the more you process it the more you realize it really sits in very easily with the rest of the work that he's mm. done uh mm. maybe not aesthetically or in terms of the actual like parental content, but certainly in terms of its themes and its characters, it, it feels very much a piece to me of the rest mm-hmm. of the things that David Lynch has done. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I was watching this week, uh, I was looking for um, interviews or anything he did, and I, I found a, a, a pretty decent, like not a long form interview, but like a 10, 15 minute interview he did in 99 after it dropped. And one of the questions that he was asked is, hey, like, what do you say to the people that say like, this doesn't feel like a David Lynch movie. He goes <laughs> and in his own little wry way. He goes, well, it's his quote was, it's a hair absurd because I made the movie. So it has to be a David Lynch. movie. <laughs> <laughs> he gives a really good interview. He's a very he interesting does. interview. He can be very prickly sometimes, but also really open up for the right question. I would be terrified to interview him, but, but also very curious because he just gives interesting quotes like that all the time. So I'll throw a little plug and a shout out here. I, I mentioned i'm i'm an aspirational david lynch fan like i'm i'm the big sure. cinephile on the show uh, i've taken us i've seen mulholland drive and lost highway was very perplexed by them both and i've i turned mm-hmm. off i bailed on um eraserhead and inland empire i just couldn't um but i, I recently sure. this week i watched his um documentary the art life which mm-hmm. kind of maybe felt like a little bit of a skeleton key to some of these things so i think i'm gonna try again and i bailed multiple times trying to watch through the first season of twin peaks so i'm excited to maybe take a swing at some of these things again i think i think first of all i think that straight story is a great david lynch movie for people who don't like david lynch because it is such a it's relatively conventional uh in terms of the narrative i see the same thing about elephant man which i believe is his first Agreed. that's major my other film. favorite and that's very straightforward and and easy to follow and also and based doesn't on take... a true story also based mm. on a true story um, I do feel like Twin Peaks is sort of the the litmus test. If you like Twin Peaks, you'll probably like the rest of David Lynch. If you don't like Twin Peaks, then you probably won't. <laughs> so that and it's not for everybody. I don't think it's a moral failing to not be a Lynch fan or, or anything like that. It is a it's, so it's a very the film friends and and I don't like I don't feel bad about it, but I'm like I, I want to get it. I see other people's enjoyment <laughs> sure. and like I've listened to like. Twin Peaks, like hours of Twin Peaks podcast where people talk about it. And I enjoy other people's enjoyment of it, but I'm like, it's not, 
it's not clicking. <laughs> so the documentary, I feel like, helped me a little bit here. That could maybe but, help. Yeah, that could help. We should probably get to the straight story. Yeah, uh, our subject should. here. So uh, as Tyler alluded to, uh, it's based on a true story. Uh, it came out in 99. It's a story about uh, Alvin Strait. He was a 74-year-old, 70, 73-year-old guy um, who drove like almost 250 miles across state lines to go visit his brother who was sick to uh, to make up with him. And, 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 and he didn't just drive anything. He drove. That's true, yeah. A lawnmower. <laughs> he drove, drove a lawnmower with <laughs> pulling a trailer. Out, on Wikipedia, apparently, um, the top speed was five miles an hour, so. Covered about 250 miles, going five miles an hour, just to see his brother and make up when they were very old it, men. It's sort of the real life version of that. I just thought of, but of the the Dumb and Dumber scene with the <laughs> I can't think of the name of the bike they ride across Colorado to get yes. to the Aspen. Treat which, it for the van, straight yeah, up. Exactly. <laughs> straight up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a true, but it is a true story, and it's why it's a wild true story, and evidently it was a story that that uh, Lynch's longtime uh, producing partner Mary Sweeney was very very interested in telling, and and uh, Wade sat on the rights for years until she could talk, she could find a way to for Lynch to do it, and and then he did. Yeah, the story to get that movie made is almost as interesting as the the movie itself, and that it was him, that like. Like we talked about, on the surface, he's a very strange, he is not the guy that you think of first. But I mean, because of his his deep interests in in humanity and in what lies beneath, uh, sometimes he does that very sinisterly. But in this story, like the things that uh, are underneath, like, are yeah. the very human things that we, we talk yeah. about a lot on the show, which I thought, man, I don't know if Trevin Vince will like this on the surface, but I'm hoping we can kind of... <laughs> talk him into it or or just yeah. kind of see the value well what did you what did you guys think because because well, we you know you know how i feel you know now but what do you yeah. what do you think about it so i told I'll, I'll jump in first i told phil uh in my initial reaction that it was boring but i liked it okay. and i think that kind of reflected the general mood you know the film it's like the lawnmower's top speed was five miles an hour and it felt like that was also the top speed of the film as well like mm -hmm. just very it's it's not high action every you know very long fade transitions like mm -hmm. long panning scenes a lot of scenery of the midwest um but it gives you time to slow down and contemplate and get past the surface of people because when you're driving past people you know at 50 miles an hour on a highway like you don't see anything about their story but when you ride by them at five miles an hour on John Deere, then you you uh, end up finding out a lot more about them that gives you reasons to empathize with them, be surprised at them, um, be in awe of their humanity. And so that's why I say it was boring, but I liked it. Mm -hmm. so there wasn't a ton that happened, but it was about people. And, and I like that. Vince, what are some of your initial thoughts here before we kind of get to some of the meat of the film? Dude, give it to us for real. It's all right. It's all right. You don't have keep to. It a, I'm going to keep it a buck. Um, I, I don't want to say, like, the best part of the movie was the credit. Did you watch but... it? Did you watch it, like, with your phone down? Did you, like, yeah, watch, no, watch it? I watched it. I watched it. Um, I don't know. I, I'm I, So I'm on this podcast. I, I love substantive content, right? <laughs> And we've had different films that we've covered that, you know, you really got to distill it and really get into the mind of the creators and the actors and the scene and things like that. So yeah. it's not like I'm not a person who can't go down that avenue. Yeah. For whatever reason, this movie was like, it didn't a, get you there. it's just flatline for me. <laughs> and I, and it's, and it's not that I didn't get it. It's like, I heard the stories about the wars and heard the story about his brother and heard the story about family and the daughter and all of that. I, I listened to those stories and it's like, okay, cool. Um, but it, it, it just like, it just, this film for me, it just <laughs> did nothing for me outside of the one thing where I was telling, uh, Trev before, uh, off air was, um, when he made the reference about like remembering his, uh, when he remembered like the people who had fallen, they stay young as he gets mm -hmm. older. 
And the only reason why that was like relatable for me is because I had a friend who uh, passed away in like middle school and like I remember him. And uh, as I get older and I'm growing up and kind of coming into the man that I'm supposed to be, uh, you know, any thought that reminisces him is still this middle schooler, this like seventh grader. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's like, yeah, okay, I get that. That's cool. But it it wasn't like it didn't penetrate my heart or anything more than it was just like, okay, I, I can relate to that. So for me, I, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, but no, it, this right. just wasn't it just wasn't my speed. Maybe Honestly, a racer head like will be it. your jam and, and you'll really dig that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I mean, I, I, I'm not I, I, tr- I want to take like we talked about uh, in the or like um Philip talked about in the Make It Plain podcast about having intellectual integrity. I can have movie integrity, and you know, even <laughs> though I'm convict and convinced that this is not that good of a movie, you know, <laughs> if things come through, I can I can change my mind. Nice. I, I'm free to change my mind, but mm-hmm. as it stands right now, uh, Vin- Vincent doesn't like it. <laughs> well, right, now just, not... <laughs> right now, it's just better than Monos. <laughs> <laughs> well, my goal is not necessarily to get you to like it, but I mean, I, I think there's a lot of substance here that maybe just wasn't your particular taste and really like when you watch movies at different times too like there's sometimes when i watch a movie for this podcast or if i'm doing another podcast and it's like if it's an assignment that's different than oh what do i want to watch this looks interesting and like mm-hmm. you can kind of be in a different mood and kind of take it in differently yeah. and i wonder how this would have sat for me if i had if it had not if it had been my first david lynch movie because i do think going into it with some david lynch vocabulary yeah in your backpack because it is subversive in a way right be a little bit i i could see how um if this had been the first lynch movie i'd seen i'd feel very lost in a lot of the um like the shots and feel like it was very uh like you said trevor was very slow and and i don't necessarily like there the plot doesn't necessarily seem to be there's i'm not there's no three-act structure there's no we're not there's no big revelations or anything like that but having seen some some other lynch movies when i first saw this one i think maybe it gave me a little more of an, an understanding of maybe what he was trying to do with it, which doesn't just make it a better movie or you, you could maybe argue that, well, if you can't really understand the movie, if you haven't seen the rest of the movies, then isn't that a, a point against it, which I guess mm. you could, which might be the case, but it did in that case probably help me appreciate it more than I would have otherwise. Sure. Mm. And, and yeah, I think that's, that's probably why this is my first, cause I, I don't, you guys talk about twin peaks and, and eraser head. And it's like, bro, I did not is, know, like, he's, he's, I don't know he's about any of that dude. either. He's a, he's, he's 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 a brilliant, a, wonderful, weird dude, but he's a, like, he's a weird dude. I was like, David Lynch. I'm pretty sure Philip said that name once. he's he's pretty he seems very to me so it's it's hard for me to talk about david lynch part of the reason i was kind of nervous about this podcast because i feel like there uh, i I never felt like i've been very good at talking about his movies Mm -hmm. um because they're hard to talk about and i think that's deliberate i I think that he's he uh he considers himself a painter primarily right yeah, he he said that, and I, and I think there's a he. The reason he's chosen the film medium is because he can talk about things and stories that you wouldn't really have a language to talk about otherwise. So he talks mm-hmm. about them in his movies. That he said that's why he doesn't like to do interviews about his movies it's because like, just he's like, watch well, it. I I said everything I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, I don't know like... what else to say about it. I, I put it all in there. Um, I do think that he's very interested in uh and the the rotting of the american dream and the uh-huh. underside of the american dream and the the difference between the surface of how americans are doing and what's happening beneath without separating mm-hmm. those two cuz i do think that he's able to dignify very strange oddballs that he loves to populate his movie with, but he mm-hmm. wants you to be sort of shocked by them initially. And then the more you get to know them, the more you understand why they are the way that they are yeah. and understand some of the things that have happened to them. Oftentimes very terrible things that have mm-hmm. led them to be the kind of people that they are. Uh, in twin peaks, this gets a little bit supernatural. There's he, he pretty plainly hints at some otherworldly forces that are twisting 
people who would otherwise be good, kind Americans and, and making them darker. Uh, but in movies see, like that's The Straight my jam Story, right there. I'd, we'll I'd see, watch, I might watch Twin Peaks then. <laughs> give it a shot, man. But but fair warning, it, it is a it is yeah. a trip. It, and it very much is like the dear lady in this movie. Like yeah, those yes. are the kind of characters. On ten, those are the kind of characters that are all of the characters in this other stuff, <laughs> or the majority of the characters. There's, there are some. I mean, speaking about odd characters, I mean, like they're definitely not surreal characters in this movie, but definitely a bunch of oddballs. I mean, if you Hyper think about real, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah the cast yeah. of characters. Maybe the most normal dude is the guy who kind of lets him stay on his front lawn for a while. Uh-huh. Sure, uh, yeah, very yeah. Joe American. Yeah, mm-hmm. but other than that, I mean, if just from the jump, we're just introduced to a bunch of weird folks, whether it's, like, the very first character you see is his neighbor who's, like, <laughs> tanning outside, uh-huh. oddly, uh-huh. Um, and, like, has no idea what's going on, and then you're introduced to his daughter who's who's got her own things going on. Some developmental disability issues, yeah. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, I wasn't sure what it was. I, I didn't look into the actual real story. I, I but... think they have said autism is what they... I think in real life, his daughter was, okay. was on the autism that spectrum. Was, I thought that was a heartbreaking story. So for the right. audience, we're, we're kind of all over the place. For the audience, he finds out his brother is sick. They are, for undisclosed reasons at the beginning, and kind of, they don't explicitly talk about what happened Yeah, um, Which between I like. them. Um, but yeah, then, they never say it, yeah. Yeah, so he, he and his estranged brother, they're both in their 70s. He finds out his brother has a stroke. And he decides he's 250 miles away and he decides to go. And then the movie, like the movie movie, is really just little episodes of him like yeah. engaging with people along the way on his very, <laughs> very long, slow journey across state lines in a tractor. It's almost yeah. episodic. Like yeah. it, it could almost be a, like yeah. a, yep. a limited series uh, with just different little skits along the way mm-hmm. of of the people he meets. And you get to know more about him and some of the things he went through, especially as a World War II veteran, that have led him to be this this kind of grouchy, but mostly very like kind and clearly like very very loving. You know, really loves his daughter, who's played by Sissy Spacek. I, I think she's excellent, excellent. And oh, yeah. I, I think all she the performances are really good. Loved her performance on this um, film. And uh, it kind of reminded me, like, I think the Coen brothers do this a lot, too, where yes. they create this little world full of these very strange figures, and it's almost reality. Like, it almost looks like a world you know, but then it's just off to the, it's just left of center enough that it feels like they've actually created something that's unique and different. Actually, I kind of thought, that this is a little bit, but I thought the most recent Batman movie kind of stole some interest stole a little bit a few of those notes too because it created such a weird world the characters in gotham yeah. city felt it, so strange it kind of vibed coheny from you okay a little bit coheny a little in the sense just in the sense that not i wouldn't it didn't feel like a Cone brothers movie but it did feel like they created a different type of world sure where somebody like the batman made a little more sense like it in very a much city this like strange yeah, in a city this weird with this many weirdos in it, it seems like everybody's got kind of their own weird thing. It doesn't seem that strange that a guy like Bruce Wayne would be like, "Well, I'm going to be a detective who dresses like a bat." Like, well, yeah, sure, everybody's got a weird thing in this city. That might as well be your weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I I kind of feel like that is, is how a lot of Lynch's movies, including the Straight Story, operate, which is. They create a world that is recognizable as our own, but the people in it are a little bit hyper real, either hyper real or surreal, depending on your definition of it. And that makes it all go down just a little bit easier because it doesn't. The fact that you can tell you're somewhere that's not quite real life allows you to take all that in and the strange stuff that happens a little more easily. Yeah. So do we have any any favorite episodes or I don't know if we want to go through them all, but I thought there was hmm. some really great stuff there. Vince, you said the one that really that you liked was the guy at the bar towards the end. Yeah, um, I believe it was that one. It, it it was either that one or when he was talking to those young guys who were like, "What's what do you uh, like? Sure, what's worse cyclist? about being old?" Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just at that point, and like I said, it was, was relatable. A great line. Yeah, and and it it is. It's a very it's a it encapsulizes something that 
is absolutely true, like universally, but not often thought about, about like you have people that you've known, whether it's family members, friends, uh, you know, em- uh, employees or, or coworkers, whatever that have passed away or something like that. And then as you get older and continue to live life, um, and for whatever reason, whether you read a book or watch a movie or something, it sparks back into your head, that person and how you remember them is like, man, I'm getting older in all of these years. And this person in a sense is trapped in youth in my mind, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. that's a, that's a really weird way of thinking about it, but it's a very true way of thinking about it. So the yeah. cyclists, the young guys, I want to. Hit you guys with that. What's our take on, and not to be super Jesus jukey, but I thought it was an interesting response. They asked him like, Hey Alvin, like what's, what's the worst part of being old? Like, cause he's a very old guy and there are all these young cyclists doing mm-hmm. this cross country trip or whatever. And he said, the worst part about being old is remembering when you were young. What do we mm. think about that? Mm-hmm. How does that line hit us? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one, right? Like just, I don't know. There, there's a lot of reminiscing in this movie about like, stuff and and how how life has turned out and you know things that could have gone different or things that you know didn't turn out well or where where life wasn't kind but still i don't know it's just interesting yeah i i i i, I think it's relatable like i think think people get it like sure. yeah super Obviously, relatable more able. i um <laughs> to kind of show my hand my 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 mind kind of goes dark sometimes um because when I think about that, like, as you get older, the cruel thing is, like, remembering you were young. But the reason why it's cruel is because the older you get, the more the realization of the finality of your life is coming upon you. Mm-hmm. And, like, though there's a part of me that's inclined by my faith to be, like, I'm not necessarily worried about what's going to happen after more than it is the function of things like the reality that I currently live in ceases to exist, at least for me. Mm-hmm. And as I get older, like I've only ever been alive. So you know how people say, sure, well, live, yeah. live like it's your last day. I've never had a last day. So how do I do that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh-huh. it's like, as I, as, as I get older, it does kind of say, well, there, there is an ending to this life and this existence as you are experiencing it. And the truth of that, the finality of that, uh, the inevitability of that sometimes can be quite a haunting thing. And then as you think about your past, you, you think about regrets or things you could have done differently. And, but then it's also like not comforting, even in like reminiscing or thinking about the things you could have uh, fixed in your youth, because it's like, it wouldn't have made me live forever. Maybe a little longer, a couple of years, couple of months, couple of days, couple of minutes, but it's not going to make me live forever. And that finality is still on its way. And yeah. so I think that's just kind of where my mind goes. I think that, that and that's really, really wise and, and very astute, Vince, because I, I think that the um, what what lands for me about that conversation with the cyclists in particular, but I think a running theme of the whole movie is as he's approaching the end of his life, he's, he is kind of meditating not on the golden years of his youth, but on all the regrets that he has and sure. the, the people that he hurt and the relationships that fractured. And, uh, and I think that's a very real thing. Uh, I think we all have those and knowing how to, to reckon with the fact that that is, you can change tomorrow. You know, you can always, you know, you can, you can change what's, what you're going to do with the rest of your life until you start getting towards the end of it. And you're running out of time to make those changes. And the things that you've done are, are, those are frozen in stone, you know, those things are are done and taken care of. And that can be very, I would imagine, especially, you know, none of us are that old yet, but, but we're getting there. And I would imagine the older you get, the more of those things sort of come back to, to knock on your door again. Like, I I guess, I guess that's a relationship that's just not going to be healed. You know, those things, I think people kind of have to live with those. And so that, for sure, that this is a very sad movie in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It's very bitter. There's a real, undercurrent of not depressing but but sort of bitter sweetness like a a very tent yeah heartache is a great word yeah yeah yeah, just just a a sort of like 
I cannot imagine Disney greenlighting a G-rated movie like this today. It's just like, mm. it's <laughs> like inconceivable to me that this was a Disney movie because it's a, it's about a, a bunch of old people meditating on, on the end of their life and, and yeah. trying to patch things up best they can before the end. With I don't a think lot that would of very good anymore. smoking scenes too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that <laughs> definitely wouldn't happen. And did you pick that on Disney right. Plus? It <laughs> opens with the, uh, the depictions of smoking <laughs> of tobacco yeah. or something like that. Yeah. 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 Say, so, don't smoke, kid. Kids, but I do love, yeah. I'd love old guys smoking on TV and film. <laughs> it's very cinematic. So, so that, that, I think that's, I think that's really true, Vincent. The, the, I loved the, that, that really hits for me. And it's also, um, I don't know about scary, but, but sobering to think about sure. that era coming for all of us. Some of us maybe sooner than we think of starting to reckon with, okay, what have I done with my, with my one wild, precious, beautiful life? And Mm -hmm. what have I left behind both in terms of the good things, of course, which he, as we start to realize he has lots of, but also the bad things, which are just kind of there. And yeah. And just to tag on that one last piece to, to add to that equation, uh, to, to, to the sobering aspect is um, the uncertainty because it's like, I think we all assume I'll probably make it to 80 at least maybe 75 mm-hmm. you know as long as i don't eat too many cheeseburgers or whatever <laughs> and it's like so you know you the, the assumption is always i'll have tomorrow and but then, we blink but and then, we're all halfway there <laughs> yeah, yeah but then exactly. that's the thing yeah. and and yeah. you see so many stories or so many uh you know news reports or whatever of people in that are younger than us right now who are gone or people who are our age that are gone and people that are not dying at what is expected or what's assumed, you know, that's that ending of life is supposed to occur in a natural way, in a gradual way. And I think it's because you don't get to like, if you die too early and be like, all right, Lord, I want to respawn because I wasn't ready to die then. (laughs) (laughs) You can't do that. You can't exercise that, that power. And so I think that part of it is also can be, like you said, uh, Tyler's like super sobering because it's like it could be in the next 30, 40, 50 years, even where we are now, or it could be tomorrow. And it's like, and you don't know and you won't know. And it's like, come on, bro. Come on. Can I get a cheat code or something? You know, so I think it just adds to the to the sobering nature of it. Which is something that, that Lynch explores in Twin Peaks a little bit, which is the the central sort of theme is the death of Laura Palmer, who was this young all-American girl who had her whole mm-hmm. life ahead of her. And in the, the first scene of the first episode, she ends up dead. And Damn. most of the most of the rest of the show, the, the two seasons of the show, are trying to figure out what happened and why she died. And as you as you unpack her life, you realize these that on the one hand, she was uh, she was very kind, and she was, had a great relationship with her parents, and and had a, her friends really loved her, and boyfriend really loved her. But on the other hand, there was there was also a lot of darkness that she grappled with in this small mm. Twin Peaks in this small town, and and she thought she would have time to sort that out, to get that get that dark side kind of taken care of, and as it turned out, she didn't. So this is a Dang. that's just to underscore something that Lynch Lynch <laughs> has thought about and has grappled with and, and I'm seriously uh, going to consider it, Twin Peaks now. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, I'll spark I, my I can't wait to hear what you think, man. Yeah, I, I can't, can't wait to hear what you think. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I've watched uh, a show called Chambers. It's starting to remind me of that. It's a uh, Netflix original, and it it's super weird and it dives into a heart transplant that is r- real crazy, and it's talking about like Jewish folklore, and it's it is wild. But it's like that was good. So if I can take that, I'm gonna give Twin Peaks a, a chance. All right. Sounds All good. Right. All right, I'm ready. Um, I can't wait to hear. <laughs> I definitely sure. report back I'm, on that. I'm, one. I won't make that commitment. Um, Trevor, you would not like it. <laughs> 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 Want to go back to the part about like not knowing what we can and can't fix or or remedy in our lives. Uh, I was talking mm-hmm. with Trevor the other day where he goes, like, there are a lot of these things, but it feels kind of like. What what are like some angles that we can hit on the show? And so this is only the second slash third because I, I partially watched it. I watched it in January for the first time, and I got the um, apparently the only Blu-ray is this a uh, newer Australian company that puts out a bunch of stuff region free. So they had a commentary track on it, and I was partially watching it regular, partially watching it with a commentary track. But um, only really the second time that I've seen it, and I was just really hit like 
this movie is about a man who knows that like his time is very limited and what he chooses to do is like inch across the country to make up with his brother. Like in the time that we're living in right now with families being torn Mm -hmm. apart by nonsense and things like that, like the story of a man who's like, if my last act on this earth is making up with my brother, like that's what I'm determined to do. Like I just thought through that lens, like kind of all of the little vignettes hit me a lot more powerfully on my second viewing. In the yeah. sense that the the clock is ticking on this guy and this is how he's spending the yeah the, yeah. the final. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a really good I mean, we've all talked about this on the show to a degree. Like it's been a trying time <laughs> the last several mm-hmm. years and like relationships that have been our whole lives or decades and decades have gotten very weird slashed. Some of them have dissolved and it's like, well, some of these, okay. Like you said, some of these are just gone and that's, that's a bummer, but that's fine. But like some of these, it's like, man, I'd really love to, to see progress made (laughs) in as much Uh as it, it depends on the actions that I can take and just kind of watching it through that lens. I mean, I loved it the first time, but I liked it even more. I think this is going to be, I mean, I I might not watch this every year, but this is going to be, in, in the rotation for me. I really love this movie. I, I, I really do too. And I'm sorry to the, to the half of the, the podcast here who was, wasn't quite as enthralled by it. The, oh, okay. the core of the podcast who, who really didn't like it. And, and the, the boring take was that. good. I'll take that. I think it was, I, I think it is insofar as you can describe a, if you judge a movie by accomplishing what it set out to do, like it had, it set out these goals and it accomplished them. I think it's pretty close to perfect. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think, depending on the day you asked me, it, it would probably, it might be my favorite David Lynch movie. The, just the, I think the best thing yeah. he's ever done. And he's done some really good, some stuff that's really, really good. I, I do think he, occasionally he just gets too far out for me and <laughs> I can't quite go there with him. Or I just feel, I think it gets a little too messy for his own good and, and it go, mm. can even veer a little too dark for its own good. But this I thought was great. Just great. Yeah. I like what Phil brings up about like that theme of reconciliation and how um, that kind of goes throughout the movie. And and there's a lot of kind of even the vignettes kind of kind of say some of that stuff. I mean, yeah. So, except for the dear lady who just kind of drives off, but uh, <laughs> I like the dear lady. <laughs> I do too. I'm a fan. Of, uh, yeah. I'm pro dear lady. Yeah. I, 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 I dear, think she's a. And she I love dear. A Mike Drop is one of the best like <laughs> final dear. lines of a character. Yeah. And I love dear. Drives away. Drives off. And then he's like, well, uh, I guess I got venison tonight. All right. I'm going <laughs> to uh, keep crawling Which down the road. I was super impressed that uh, he was able to dress that deer with uh, his hip function. But anyway, <laughs> um, th- there's there's a theme in the movie that really stood out to me was just the, the prizing and the valuing of old age. I don't know if it's just the, the culture today. Like we've talked about this before about ageism on this podcast and about um, kind of the devaluing, especially as we commercialize human beings, right? Mm-hmm. You can, it's, it's harder to commodify old people um, in the sense of, unless you're going to exploit them. Like they're it's, not it, hot and exciting. But it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's harder to, um, yeah, for that. And, and also like productivity and things like that. But sure. You know, and so our culture just like really thrives on on what what you can do for me, right? But this film really centered old people in a really unique way. There's very few like actually young characters. It seemed like like the cyclists, I think um, the, the girl, young really. the one the young runaway girl. Um, me me and Vince mentioned like maybe the twin like. The John Deere yeah. mechanics mm-hmm. like kind of fit in that. Kind of Olsen that, like, twins, hilariously. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very funny. Um, but but just kind of like, and all of them kind of have either this camaraderie or this wisdom. But there's like kind of what you guys are saying. This scratch the surface. Like there's just this depth to them throughout the film. We see Alvin's like what his what his years has have given him. Um, on the one hand, he's um kind of filled with regret on some of these things in his life. But at the other hand, he also has like this deep wisdom and experience to give advice um, to different people to know what to do. You know, he, you know, he can, he can build a fire and, and take care of himself on the road. There's something very like rugged about his, 
his ability you know he's he, at one point he says like i was in you know the the fields in in france and germany you know in world war ii so why should i be scared of a cornfield in iowa you know like just this yeah. very robust rugged like from a life of fully lived in a way um hmm. he has wisdom you know he's a wisdom of how he overcame his own demons of alcoholism and how he kind of exhibits his own humanity and vulnerability, but also brings out somebody else's as they commiserate together. And just like, there's just so much value that this film shows in a full human life, like in a, in a long human life that I feel like I just hadn't seen it that explored in a lot of places, like even if in films that center older characters, there might be like a buddiness to it, but it's not really about the the wisdom or the depth that that old age brings to them. And I feel like there is a lot of that here. It really is unique and refreshing. Outside of, uh, I can think of some older, and it, it wasn't like the entirety of the film, but there was definitely a large segment in uh, the Klansman. Um, where they were really gleaning to some some old 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 wisdom, um, but and and that's as you describe that that's the movie that that really the only movie so far that's come to my mind where they've ever done that where they're actually like just hmm. clinging to the words of someone who's who's lived a long life. And I think something that you hear a lot in movies like this. Um... And, and you hear a movie, The Klansman is another example of something similar, where you take somebody who is maybe not normally the subject of a, of a big movie, um, and they talk about how this like dignifies that character or gives them dignity. And I don't like that phrase. Um, it feels very patronizing to me. Mm-hmm. It, like, like, oh, thank goodness our Hollywood saviors have come along to <laughs> bless this person with a little bit of dignity, their magic wand of dignity. And, 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 sure, sure. and, uh, and I think that's how a lot of Hollywood filmmakers see themselves as well as this is some, mm. you know, they have the ability to do this. Mm-hmm. So it, it goes mm. both ways. I don't think Lynch does that. It, this feels way more honest and mm-hmm. um, mm. almost like he's, he's exposing something that's already there yeah, and yeah. he lets it unspool very organically Instead yeah. of giving, he doesn't give Alvin some big heroic moment, you know, where <laughs> no. he gets to, you know, he, but it, but you just sort yeah. of gently see over time that there's a lot more to this person than you might have thought at first. There's more to the people that he meets along the, on the road than you yeah. might have thought at first. And that this could happen with anybody in life that you meet yeah. in, in, uh, on your own lawnmower drive across yeah. America. You, you, the, every person that you come across, no matter how strange or off-putting at first, does have a lot going on underneath the surface. And if you yeah. take the time to, to explore that, then you might find out what it is. You might not like what you find. It might yeah. be very troubling, as it often That's is true. in David Lynch's movies. And yeah. Sometimes those people might life. end up being genuinely dangerous yeah you know like they, they may have ideologies or or they, they may be criminals or they they uh-huh. may have be coming from another dimension to to try Could to be. kidnap you and create Never a clone happened. of you which does happen in twin peaks but uh but they are but i think lynch does believe that there is a lot uh he he lets people tell their own stories in a way that i think is very difficult to do in film yeah and i really appreciate that in straight story especially and in a- and then you, you mentioned like in a natural way that doesn't feel like beating you over the head or super no. didactic. Like I, yeah. I thought the, um, I, I loved it the first time, but I was thinking more about his, uh, the little episode with the runaway girl in the campfire. Uh-huh. So like oh, all the different I like that pieces one. at play there. So his, his daughter who is some sort of like autistic challenged, like mm-hmm. her kids were taken away for no fault of her mm-hmm. own because they're like, well, She's not 100% fully functional by our standards, so let's take her kids away. And that was just, it wasn't a throwaway thing, but like that event in a film could be very like mm-hmm. milked for, in like kind of a disingenuous way for the emotion totally. of it. But he's just like, look, family's happen. important. Like she ran away from her family. It's like, man, my daughter would really love to like be able to have her kids and she can. Like, I, I know you got stuff with your family, but like, Family is important, and all those little things kind of at play. None of them were like super trumpeted, like like here's this truism. But it's just like mm-hmm. like an old man who's who's seen it, who's experienced it, 
who's watched other people go through yeah. it. And it's just like, well, just sharing from he, it wasn't experience. pushy at all. It's just like, yeah. well, here it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you have to, the thing that the film kind of pressed on me, and I don't know if I'm looking too far into it, you know, Philip, how I do, but like, it felt like you have to go at his pace to be able to benefit from that. If, mm-hmm. if you want the action and the quick, and like, if you're in that mode, you will never get past the surface to really get to enjoy that. And so like, yeah, he's old. He he walks with two canes. He he can't drive a car. He rides on a lawnmower. Like so, he's going slow. But if you want to benefit from your encounter with him, you have to be willing to not just speed by, but go at his pace. And I felt like that is kind of it, it felt almost like an exhortation to me at some level. Like you know, it's easy to talk about like the value of humanity and the value of folks in their old age. But like, there's a reason why it's hard to access that as a young person in, in this gauge where it's go, go, go all the time. Like we have to be willing to slow down to have a deeper interaction with somebody to be humble enough to let go of our own busyness and schedule and stuff like that to just, if we value that interaction enough to just encounter a person with all of their experience. Theology of mm-hmm. place. We I feel like all the last yeah. like dozen or so shows, shows no. we've come back to that at some no. point. We could, we create a YouTube playlist of that. <laughs> That should probably be one of our next little groupings. Um, there you go. Before, I think we, we've mentioned it before, but I think the the second to last big episode was uh, the guy at the bar um, who who took him to and where they talked about the war. That was probably the longest one, and I think maybe one of the most substantive in a way because that's where probably the the most significant thing in Alvin's life was kind of talked about. It, it wasn't clear if. He had never talked about it before or or what mm. his experience in the war. Did you guys kind of get any sort of um, reading on that? Because, I mean, he, he dropped a pretty, I mean, spoiler warnings. Like, I, I don't know if we want to talk about it exactly. Like, he, he talked about a very tragic thing that happened in the war that it, it sounded like he maybe had never told anybody about before. Yeah. The kind of friendly and fire event. It wasn't to any plot end where, oh, this is the key yeah. to this. It's like, no, this is like part of my full human experience as Alvin. Like, this is a part of me. And and maybe you can read into, like, he wished he could make up for things, so maybe that's part of his motivation. But it wasn't really for, well, let this explain the plot. But this is more fully fleshing out. This is a person. Mm-hmm. This is a person, and this is what they've gone through to be here. And and it made me want to see him uh, reconnect with his brother and and accomplish that a little bit more. I think you're. I do like, and this is something Lynch is very good at too. Is is having um, not everything is. And in this movie, I actually there's not a lot of things that drive the plot forward because the plot is pretty much he's going from point A to point B. You know, yes. like there's <laughs> not a you don't need a lot of plot devices to yeah. to keep things going on this front. But I also think there was, I think a, a more conventional director probably would have alluded to it, uh, you know, in, in some sort of like flashback yeah. sequence yeah. or, oh, or he hears a gunshot and it, you know, you start seeing like bombs go off and, and the, and the like black and white around him and on Normandy or whatever. Mm. And, uh, and I love that in this case, cause that's just not how no. things always work. So you can know somebody, you know, how many people, including myself, you, you, you've known your grandpa your whole life. And then one day your grandpa tells you a crazy story from his past about something very yeah. significant that would be, that clearly defined him and was defining for him, but that you would have never known about, uh, had he not volunteered that. And I think that's yeah. really important to understand and very key to understanding a lot of Lynch's characters is that idea of there's always so much going on beneath the surface that you would never know if you didn't take the, if if you didn't have the benefit of a filmmaker there, or if you didn't take mm-hmm. the time to really talk to them and listen to them over a long period of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, I love that. I, I really love that. And that's a very, it's pretty haunting. It's a haunting sequence and, and reframes a lot of the previous interactions that he's had in yes. mm-hmm. some interesting ways. Mm. Well, and then the final one was the priest, which, it's mm-hmm. also interesting to me how many explicit, direct, like, 
either biblical references or mention of religion, the church, pastor. He yeah. said a pastor helped him stop drinking. Like just in my mind, I was like, well, that's kind of interesting and nice. Like there was no cynical Lynchian, like, but he was really like a terrible guy. Like <laughs> typically, yeah. like you don't see uh, ministry men as in positive lights a lot of times for good reasons. But um, mm-hmm. I was just like, well, that's nice. Like, a pastor competent to counsel a person in need. Like, and you didn't even see that. Like he just mentioned it in passing. Um, but then mm-hmm. at the end, just having that, that nice little talk with the priest before he, he finally got to his brother, just simply talking about what he wanted to do. And it was just so simple. He's like, I just want to make peace and I want to mm-hmm. sit up and look at the stars with him. Like we did when we were kids, like, mm. and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. (laughs) He says, yeah, yeah. I think that's also very true to, I I would imagine that was part of the, the, you know, true part of the story. I don't know if it was, but it's also just very true to, to, in that part of the country in the Midwest, church is just a part of people's lives. It's, it's, uh, if if you're, if you're going to stop drinking or, or really whatever, then the, then there's in all likelihood your church is going to be a part of that decision just because most people, whatever their level of actual adherence to, uh, to the church are, doctrine or, you know, how, how practicing they are, their, their lives still are, the church is still a big part of just their civic life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I can, I, I can totally see that if it wasn't true, then it's certainly a very believable part of the story. Sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, I, I was looking through my notes here, Trevor, you, you mentioned it earlier. He actually said it explicitly in a conversation with the guy at the bar your um, just kind of observation of you kind of need to sit and, and watch as he, he talked about when he was the sniper, he just had the little sentence that I wrote down. It's amazing what you can see when you're sitting down. And I was like, that's kind of like the thesis of this movie. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like when you're uh-huh. sitting down with somebody or he was talking about when he's like just sitting down observing, mm-hmm. like yeah. you can see a whole lot. Yeah. Thanks for finding the quote to back up what I felt was the theme. <laughs> and I mean, pretty much after that, he finds his brother. I, I love yeah. the wrap up. I love the wrap up of the film. Like just, I love the end. It's yeah. so real. Like I, I, I remember them Harry getting Dean together Stanton. and you're like, I just felt like, mm, what do you say at that point? You know, like you've got this thing that's in the past and it just feels like so dumb to bring up, but like, it's no trivial. Like, and they just like, kind of don't deal with it. You know what I mean? In a way, like the film doesn't show you like this big revelation, like, but he's there. He's, his presence is accepted and, and it, into the shot, you know, like he knows where his brother lives and he sees the, the, like there's a shot of him look like, yeah. All they do is like, he wrote that thing all the way out here. Yeah. (laughs) Like the distance between us to come see me. Like I accept that. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, it's an extremely guys yeah. being dudes moment. Like that feels <laughs> <True>. very. <laughs> yeah. this movie, <laughs> That's good. A uh, hardware uh, store scene also very good for oh, some was humor, one of actually. My, yeah. That was like <laughs> the grabber. The grabber. Yes. Yeah. That <laughs> almost felt Napoleon Dynamite to me. Like just it the did. cast of like sure. old guy characters, and then like he's what he's using it all as a bargain. <laughs> It takes me a to order another one of those. <laughs> oh, geez, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do love the, I, I love the hardest robot. But I think the ending is very, it's very beautiful without being saccharine. Like it's not, yeah. it's not cloyingly sweet. It, it's not a Hollywood yeah. ending. Yeah. It just, but it's still very beautiful and very touching and very tender. And yeah. all the more powerful probably for how understated it is, and and it it feels real, and it feels sweet, and it feels absolutely it feels like what mm-hmm. two brothers, two estranged brothers would do. And we don't. I, I I'm I love that they don't go into whatever the thing or multiple things were that led to where they're at because it's just not super important to the story. And mm-hmm. I think it makes it all almost all the more powerful mm-hmm. for the fact that whatever it was that was in the past has. It doesn't really isn't really as important as the fact that they're there now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to be the cynical of the group <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> bringing on that. Um, there's a there is a part where I'm a little like, 
I guess sad, but sad at the fact that it took all of that to bring hmm. reconcile and restitution to a relationship. Because, yeah. you know, you, you think about the, the relationships and things that you could repair in your own life. And it, it, at least the way I'm, I'm very waffle minded. Like if we do this and do that and do this and speak here, it'll be a little messy, but make sure we kind of just go here, go here, go there. And then resolution will kind of come down the, come down the line. And it's not always that, you know, collected, but it's like, you think about the relationships that could be repaired. And in your mind, it's like, you know, if, if reasonableness is injected into this, if, um, humbleness is injected into this, if, uh, humility is, is injected into this, then we could probably fix this pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, or at least, you know, we probably need some time to settle down, you know, resolve those emotions and such. And, but we can get to a point of peace. Whereas you're looking at a story where there was a conflict or a series of conflicts, and this guy is in his 70s. And that's both of them. the point. Yeah, both of them. And then that's the point where, and he's got to, I mean, he's particularly using a, a lawnmower to get to here and going all these miles and all of these things. And so he's gone through quite a, what I would say, a tumultuous journey to an extent. To, to, to reconcile this and, and to get to a point of peace and at, at least see his brother before he's gone. And it's like, dang, why you wait that long, big dog? Like, uh, <laughs> that's, that's oh, yeah. a, that, that is one thing that comes to my mind because it's like you, you had your, you had your youth or at least, you know, mid thirties, forties, maybe fifties to, to, you know, just put that well, thing to bed. The estrangement was more recent. I think they said he hadn't talked in like, Ten Six years. or seven years or something like that. Ten, there was a line. It wasn't all oh, okay. That long. Yeah, it, it was okay. like I haven't even talked to him in like seven was, or eight years. Well, she remember uh, uh, Rose remembered exactly. It was the seventh of July, nineteen eighty-eight. Yeah, she did mention that. So yeah, even still, it's just one of those things where it's like um, I, I get that sometimes, well, especially movie. when you feel justified that someone harmed you and yeah. both people feel that way, then it's like, well, what should I repent for? What should I say sorry for? Mm-hmm. Because both individuals are thinking six you're years. the one that did wrong to me. And so mm-hmm. if you want to make it right, you better say sorry. Cause sure. I'm not. And if both people are thinking that, then nobody's going to say anything. <laughs> when you're older, you get stubborner. Man, and so that, mm-hmm. I, that 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 is definitely a thought that come to my mind. Like, man, I I I wish that maybe reconciliation could have happened a lot sooner. I think that I think that's text of the film too. I feel like that would be one of the gre- regrets that it seems like he he has, and and I don't think that he would have gotten on that lawnmower if he didn't feel burdened by the fact that mm-hmm. he had waited this long and now he's, this is his only shot, you know, that he's mm-hmm. got the only way he can really make this restitution is to do something that would have been a lot easier when he was a younger man and could have driven up there or bought a plane ticket or whatever. But, but uh, instead he's forced to do this. And I do think that the idea of, they probably, they probably both felt very justified in what they were doing and they probably both felt like the other one needed to come to them. And, uh, and, you know, the idea of forgiveness. I don't know. There's, I think there's this idea you often hear about like f- how good forgiveness is for the soul and, and how, you know, you need to, you know, you have this thing that's been on your back. You, you know, if you're holding a grudge, that's going to weigh you down. It's going to poison you. But if you release it and forgive the other person, then, then this relief will wash over you. That has not been my experience with forgiveness. It, forgiveness feels like you're relinquishing a, your right to justice, you know, you're, you know, if I've been wronged and I forgive you, then what I'm saying is I don't need recompense for this anymore. And in my experience, I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's a good thing to do. I don't know that it's necessarily been like a really soothing, like unburdening Mm. process, Mm. which I think is a big part of this movie. I thought about that during this movie because it does seem like, Mm. you know, then he has to, what, He'll have to go back on the lawnmower. You know, there's it's yeah. a yeah. it's a very that was you know. My it's, question. I was like, how in the heck, like, so one day you get back like, home, what is you know? going on? Like, I'm gonna live with you until I die now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just keep sending my my social security checks over, Rose. Like, and but I I love how unsentimental it is about that too. You know yeah. how uh it really 
uh, it doesn't burden itself with having some big, like, yeah. Cigarose doesn't play as he throws open the doors to the house and my brother, you've returned. You know, there's none of that, you no. know, because you don't, I don't think that's how these conversations usually tend to go. Um, but I think it's good. I, I think it's a really beautiful picture of that anyway. Yeah. So, uh, Vince, sure. we, we help you appreciate it a little bit more. Yeah. Would you I, there's some somebody somebody check it out, Vince? Would I recommend somebody? Yeah. Would you recommend <laughs> someone check it out? No, I'm not okay. gonna lie to you. That's uh, fine. That's fine. I, now, I will say in this assessment of kind of like unpacking it, I definitely get a, a little bit more substance of the things that were going on in the elements of the film. So there's like, if I appreciated it one percent, I'm probably at like fifteen percent now. Um, <laughs> out of a hundred, though, that's uh, so. a <laughs> multiplier. One to fifteen, that is quite a multiplier. I'll take it. I'm just saying, but yeah. I I mean if if this is <laughs> if Tyler this effect. is your jam, if this is your angle, if this is your avenue, if these kind of contemplative kind of stories where you have to kind of really think about what's going on and the elements of it, if that is your genre and your preference, one hundred percent. Watch it twice. But if if it's not, then you know, bro, you're just gonna be bored. So it's okay if you don't. I feel like this would make a great play. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I agree. I can see that. It feels very theatrical. Yeah. Uh, That's Trev, it. what are your final final thoughts? Recommendations? Thumbs up, thumbs down? What do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's accessible, honestly. Like, I think it's it's something that, that it's kind of like... I, I remember feeling at the end of it, oh, you know, like film for the whole family kind of thing. Like, yeah, is it going to be... Genuinely. It's going to be kind of boring, like you know, for kids or whatever, like it's not a, a kid's film that's going to entertain people, but, um, there's, there's a lot there to commit itself to is, as far as just like wholesomeness, I guess, uh, in the way it feels I mean, yeah, it does feel like, like autumn, I guess, like to take from Ebert's review, like it does, it does feel that way in a lot of ways, but I think there's, there's a lot of, of good in that and sobriety in that. Um, and, and I kind of stand by where I was at. Like it's, it's boring. But I like it. Like it's it's boring in a good way, if that makes sense. Like we boring such it's a bad life, word, yeah. but like s- sometimes it's like hurried. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, there's nothing that really happens, and it's not it's not terribly interesting, really, in some way. But then at the same time, I it disagree with is, the interesting. But yeah, the, yeah. But then at the it's same time, it is film, because exactly. it's like yeah, not in the normal way that we think about it's it. It's an inner life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it and it takes you having to be willing to to enter through what might feel like that initial barrier of boredom to get to it. That's why I say that. That's why I continue to use that word because I feel like <laughs> I just want to be upfront with people. But like once sure. you're there, there's something there's something worth it to get you to the other side of that. Tyler, what do you think on a on a revisit? I really loved it. I really did. Um... I think it's a very profound movie, and I think that it is probably like it's a film for the whole family in terms of content. Like, there's nothing that's going to offend the little ears or anything like that. Sure. I think if your kids have been raised on like, um, if, if all they Mellon. know at this point is like Paw Patrol, <laughs> then then this is going to yeah. probably going to be a little it's bit of a struggle for kid. them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, an older kid. But I think it's it's very much worth visiting, uh, if especially for it's a little hard to separate like my growing up experience because I, I really did resonate with a lot of the, the depictions of the Midwest felt very true and, and really reminded me of home where I haven't been in far too long thanks to COVID. So that impacted me a lot. And, mm-hmm. and uh, if you're interested in Dave, if you're kind of like one of those people who's like, you've heard about David Lynch, you never don't really know what your entry point is, particularly if you're kind of worried about, a lot of his movies get very dark or very violent or kind of sexual. And, and uh, if, if that's something that is going to be a, a deal breaker for your conscience, then this is a wonderful way to sort of learn what David Lynch is about his style of filmmaking and his themes and interests. That is very, uh, that is very wholesome. Like you said, Trevor and very tame and, uh, but still I think very enjoyable and, and really masterfully handled. Yeah. Did you put this out the same year that it released? Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service, the the studio Miyazaki Studio Ghibli movie, which no, I think is very similar in terms of its 
kind of unhurried, maybe plot so, lists. Ghibli is such like a big blind spot for me. I need to watch all of them. I've seen zero oh, they're great. of them. Oh, you'll love them. Oh, they're, they're <laughs> so good. Oh, I man. You're, you're in, whenever you decide to sit down, you're in for a real too. treat. I'm, I'm a big foreign movie watcher. It's just I've just never picked one up. You will. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. You, you, you know, so his best one, Spirited Away. Yeah, I, Princess I know. I know nearly all, all of them. them. You're in for oh, a treat. Oh, this is the guy that made Spirited Away. Yeah. Oh, no, Spirited Away. No, I'm talking about a different. Kiki's. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Okay. Because I, 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 I quite a year. love Spirited Away. Oh yeah, I love Spirited Away. I'm I'm really irritated that uh, they, he lost the Oscar on this one. I thought that was bogus. I, yeah. Yeah, what what, what did Michael Caine in Cider House Rules? It was fine. Like, oh, who Cider House that Rules? Movie? Yeah. Well, who I haven't thought about the that movie. Story, to be fair, this is an incredible. This... More people remember the straight story for sure than Cider. Yeah. I could, I couldn't tell you who directed Cider House Rules. Nah, um, me neither, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the only. Uh, it was the first time I'd seen Tobey Maguire as not Spider Man. I think, and and still one of the very few times i've seen him not spider-man uh, it's fine it's all i've got it's fine it's fine um, it's fine movie before we hit shout outs uh tyler uh sometimes when we have guests on the show i reach out to uh friends family associates and see if we can get a, a surprise question here at the end got a few interesting suggestions here but i think the one i'll go with is and i mean We've already kind of gone a little while here. You can decide how much you want to tell here. What's sure. the most interesting that's happened to you on an interview or junket? I don't know if they had a specific instance in mind. Most interesting thing that's happened to me on an interview or junket. Okay. Uh, interesting is one word for it. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> but this was, this was quite a while. This is one of my very first, this might have been my very first junket, actually. I was very new to the, and if you, I, I, does anybody know? Does, do people know this for word junket? Yes. Go for film it. junket is when a, a new movie comes out and they don't do this anymore post, since COVID, but they'll fly all the, the like film journalists and critics up to usually New York or LA to sit down with the cast. They watch the, we watch the movie together and then you do like a round table with the cast and, and it's, it's like a blitz of a, like a full day of just going into different small rooms, sitting down with, uh, with a different actor or maybe two actors at a time, and you all fire for a bunch of questions, then you go into the next one. And uh, the very first one I think that I did was was for The Amazing Spider-Man 2. This was the mm-hmm. Andrew Garfield, wow. Andrew Garfield, Memo Stone second <laughs> outing. Yeah. Not That's a very fondly one. remembered, not a very fondly remembered movie, obviously. Yeah. Uh, although it got a nice little bit of redemption, obviously, recently with No sure. Way Home. And, uh, but I was very excited because the cast is, was terrific and everyone never, you know, so getting to talk to, to Jamie Foxx and Andrew Garfield, Andrew Garfield is one of my favorite interviews. I've interviewed him a number of times and, and really, really enjoy and, and find him very thoughtful and, and talented and, and always like talking to him. I was jealous um, of that. Yeah, no, he's, he's he, phenomenal. He's great. Yeah. He's, he's terrific. I'm always rooting for him. And so we had been told, <laughs> we had been told that unfortunately Emma Stone will not be able to be part of today's junket experience, which was probably for the best because I had and have a huge celebrity crush on Emma Stone <laughs> <laughs> and did not need that in my life. Uh, and so I was sitting it while you're trying to do your job. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep, let's keep things professional. So this was taking place in a big hotel and we were just in the conference rooms downstairs and I had just wrapped up an interview with somebody and was sitting in there and the and i was sitting my back was to the door and i heard the door open before i could turn around i feel this hand on my shoulder it's like ooh, a nice jacket look up it's emma stone and her hand is like on me and i was like and i was like and i was like i think i said something like bloop, bloop. like i said like i, I had no, I had no like, language <laughs> and so she like sat down i don't know if she it was her mistake like she wasn't she was supposed to be talking to vanity fair and thought i was the guy i don't know what happened they i've been told i wasn't going to talk to her and she sat down and she had like five minutes it was a very short interview so i like pulled out my pen and paper and i was like let's talk and so she she so i started <laughs> asking questions that she was answering and i usually am taking notes during this but if you i wish i still had it but it was just like 
of just like doing scribbles. Like just, I could not focus. Uh, it was just like little circles in a row. I was, I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I, I was like, looking at her was like looking at the sun for me. I felt like a 12 year old boy. I was like, I just could not wow. talk around a girl uh, for the first, and it was, and so finally, you know, she was done and she was very kind and, and uh, I enjoyed it and it was very fun, sure. but that was probably the, one of, or maybe the most interesting thing that's happened to me on a, on a <laughs> that's fantastic. And my wife that's knows awesome. that story, so so that's a you, great story. You know, no shame in that. So that I'm was that's great. I think that's our good. listeners will love. We get feedback sometimes. You always get some interesting stuff. Depending, like we never try to do like a big gotcha, but friends and family, uh, people you work, people our listeners are our, our people our guests work with for a long time. They always. And come through sometimes with some uh, some good story fodder there. <laughs> well, that was, well, I I appreciate she <laughs> she'll she'll I'll I'll let her know that I answered. I I, I hope she's not thinking <laughs> of something else. And like you told him about the celebrity crush one. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, do you mean you think she's pretty? <laughs> no, she would never say. That. She would never say that. <laughs> That's perfect. That's awesome. good. We got a message for you all from our sponsor, Chris Hotchkiss. Even though we don't know what life has in store for our homes or cars, we can still prepare. Introducing the damage doesn't have to be too damaging policy from American Family Insurance. Insure carefully, dream fearlessly. Contact Chris Hotchkiss in Overland Park, Kansas at 913-268-8200 today. American Mutual Insurance Company, SI, and its operation company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. Well, shout out. Yeah. Thanks so much for the insights and everything along the way. And um, for our final segment here, we do substance shout outs, as we mentioned at the top. Just something uh, in either it could be film, but it could be books, music. We've had mobile apps. We had everything. Anything that is okay. has been something that you've been enjoying has ministered to you lately. It could be something that made you think or could just be something that you enjoy. Um, okay, I'll uh, let's see. Or things, if you can. And it can be lots of let me, things. Let me, be, yeah. let me throw two at you really fast. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll keep it to two because I because I mm-hmm. I get to consume a lot of media for my job. Uh, but yeah. I'll, I'll keep it limited to two right now. Um, first one, and this I'm a little I'm a little behind on this because uh, it came out a few months ago. Um, but uh, but I'm finally catching up on HBO Max's Station Eleven show uh, and and i find that to be just an excellent excellent tv show um a really really powerful exploration of uh it it takes i don't want to give too much away and it is kind of a difficult plot to explain sure um it was it's based on a book that was written uh i believe in the early aughts and then started to be adapted pre-pandemic but it is about a pan a global pandemic uh that in this case i think takes out like 90 percent of the world and you sort of pick up on it at different points from the very very early days of it to 10 20 years down the road after uh, after it happens and um it really has i don't know if you guys have seen the the show leftovers uh, the Damon Lindelof Fun TV list. show Leftovers, but it has a it has a very Leftovers vibe for me, and and just kind of it's it's very esoteric, it's very beautiful, it's melancholy, and I and I'm I'm not done with it yet, but I've found it extremely rewarding and very powerful. Awesome. Is it to, a, to watch. is it an ongoing or a limited? Limited to I believe they're just doing one series right now, okay. so you can you can you got like ten episodes. Up. You, you really can, love. I feel like you and like Alyssa that. both talked about the leftovers throughout all three seasons. That's probably one of your favorite favorites, TV right? show. Yeah, it's probably oh, my favorite okay. TV show. Hmm. I think that it's up there with you know it'd be on my Mount Rushmore. We'll say of TV nice. shows, but yeah, yeah, I do love the leftovers. And the other thing I do, people people who follow me know I love comics and I read a lot of comic books. And uh, so now is a great time to jump on board X Men. Uh, I've been telling anybody who who's ever been interested, if you've ever been interested in like reading about comics or if you kind of like the X-Men movies or like the old animated series and have wondered what's going on with them, they, mm-hmm. they, it has X-Men have been very bad for a long time. And X-Men fans have really been, we've been needing God's light to shine on us. And, and finally God Amen. responded and heard our prayers. And <laughs> uh, starting in around tw- about 2018, they brought a brand new creative team in. Uh, a writer by the name of Jonathan Hickman, who's a very famous comic book writer and and uh, usually stays away from like mainstream superhero comics and prefers to kind of mm. do his own things. But Marvel talked him into taking on X-Men and he's just completely changed 
the idea of who the X-Men are and what they can be and really flipped the idea of a, uh, the idea that people, when they think of what they think of when they think about the X-Men is quite different now. And it's been so successful and so interesting and so rewarding for people who've been following these characters for a long time to see this very interesting, poignant, powerful, really socially resonant new era land on them. So I would highly recommend if you have any interest in these sorts of things. And I have not had anyone disappointed yet who I've recommended it to. Oh, interesting. Starting off a new not, series called House of really X common. and Powers yeah, I was of X. Say, which, uh, which ranks I know hickman at least was writing two or three for a while is it down to one again and he is now not yeah so he started he off with house of any? x and yeah he left the okay. so he kind of like he reshuffled the deck and and left it in good hands and and it has okay. not in my mind suffered since he since he left uh but he the what, what at marvel they have what they call the x desk which is just where any comics that have to do with X-Men, be that the main X-Men or Wolverine or the New Mutants or, you know, whoever, they, they, it all happens in the same little kind of side uh, house of Marvel Comics. And Jonathan Hickman took control of that. And what he basically did is, if you know the X-Men, you know that the Professor X has this school where he brings in all the mutants and teaches them to use their mutant powers and they fight Magneto. And that that was then, but now they have, he has moved all mutants, good and bad, to an island to start their own mutant sovereign nation and try to build a utopia for all mutants. And whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, all are welcome on, on Krakoa to follow the laws there. And it gets a little bit of a Game of Thrones energy with uh, diff- you know the, the many difficulties of trying to create a new paradise and a place where a long time marginalized oppressed group of people finally have freedom to do things the way they want to do. And uh, it, it is, it's really, really thematically interesting and, and a lot of gorgeous art as well by, by a number of different artists. That's super interesting. So I where, can people, recommend it. Um, where can people find that? Local so libraries, you can, hoopla. <laughs> <laughs> you can go, if you go pick up, uh, you, you can pick up, it's called house of X and powers of X. Uh, it's, it's I think it's pronounced powers of 10. The X is supposed yeah. to be the Roman numeral. So house of X powers of 10, but it, it looks like house of X powers of X. And they have collected that into a single paperback trade paperback. So you can go buy that by Jonathan Hickman. You can also go online and Marvel unlimited is a Marvel subscription, basically Marvel's Netflix. So if you pay like nine ninety nine a month, you have access to all of Marvel's titles and uh, you can go look at it up, look it up on there. If you have any interest in that. Nice. Awesome. That's a nice. great shout out. No, yeah, I'm definitely interested. And it's like, really nice to have someone on the podcast to shout out comics. Comics, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> well, my, great. Yeah, that's my, my jam. That's my thing. I got a lot of them. I do got a lot of them. Yeah. Well, uh, Philip will have to hit you up well, afterwards the for the, the comics. Back yeah. up and you want, you yeah, want a guest, yeah, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'll keep that in mind because I do. Okay. We're on. We're on. We're all on maternity leave right now. Our yeah. since uh, our friend Hannah took it, but we're looking for a chance to start back up again. So nice. I'll let you know if it happens. Excellent. Sweet. Well, Tyler, thanks so much uh, again for joining us uh, for the straight story and uh, all the good chats we've had. Hey, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the chance to revisit a movie that I really enjoy a lot, too. So thanks for getting me back in there. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. Thanks, man. So there you have it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that. That is that is both a conversation and a film that were very special and very important for me. So hope you guys enjoyed that very much. And if you haven't seen it, man, I hope we convinced you to check it out. The current edition on Disney Plus is just gorgeous and it's just such a beautiful film one of the most beautiful human films we've covered and i mean that's that's exactly our um our target so yeah this was a perfect movie for the show hope you guys enjoyed it please if you if you did enjoy our conversation consider sharing it with your friends or on your socials that's always appreciated if you have uh feedback or thoughts things you thought we missed or something that you really appreciated and you want to tell us about it, you can DM us on Instagram or send either an email or a voice note to us at thesubstancepod at gmail.com. Um, we'd love to hear from you guys, and especially on the movies as we get substantive cinema going up as its own show. 
Uh, we'd love to interact with your guys' thoughts uh, over there. No pressure, but reminder that we do have the Patreon up. So that is patreon.com slash the substance pod. Um, as we go forward, we're definitely going to be recording some patron only content. So, or if you just want to support us for a few bucks a month, you can do that there. Or if monthly support is not really your thing, but you still want to send us a few bucks, you can do that on cash app at dollar sign, the substance pod. Um, I don't think I've done any of these plugs recently. So I will say that, um, so last month I had the privilege of joining some of my internet buddies over in the UK. Uh, on their show called The Stacks. And I'll try to put a link in the show notes because there's actually <laughs> quite a few shows called The Stacks. But uh, they invited me on because they're covering Samuel Fuller, um, one of my very most favorite directors. So they had me on to talk about his war films. We covered several. Listen, Long-time listeners may remember me mentioning Steel Helmet for a, a substance shout-out quite a while ago. So we talked about the Steel Helmet... Um, what else did we so okay steel helmet china gate and the big red one among other things um that was a wonderful conversation i did enjoy listening to their fuller series and it was a real uh pleasure to get to guest on that one and uh tomorrow if you're listening to this episode when it drops tomorrow monday june 17th um i i got to be a guest on another one of my internet friends or a, a group of my internet friends podcast over at the criterion connection ian and mckenzie great folks uh they also asked me to come on to cover a sam fuller picture so we did 40 guns over there his uh feminist western um very pro woman anti senseless violence and it's under 80 minutes it's it's a real gem and honestly the more i think about it the more i'm bumping my rating up for that so that's a lot of fun. If you're listening to this uh, the day it drops, check that out tomorrow. If you wait a couple days, that should already be up on the Criterion Connections feed. So <sighs> enjoy that. I feel like I've done other shows, but that I've maybe plugged them recently. I'll try to do a better job at shouting out my friends who are kind enough to invite me on. Um, I think that's it for those sorts of plugs. Like I said, if you guys have um, suggestions for future things that you'd like us to cover on the show, Hit us over at the email, send us a voice note or an email there, and we will uh, we'll consider that. Or actually, I think going forward, we'd love to maybe have, depending on how much time we have, maybe do some listener emails or voice memos on the show. So look forward to that. Um, I've got a couple of great, I've teased this before, I've got a few great shows already in the can. I've got a few very exciting, both substantive cinema and just banking episodes for uh, future seasons of the substance um, got some authors my time with trevor in texas we talked about some topic toss-ups i'm actually thinking about maybe doing potentially doing topic toss-ups as a uh, supporter only episode so i don't know um but yeah if you're a long time listener let me know what you think about uh trevor and i doing more topic toss-ups because that's fun too but uh, let you guys all go here it was great having you thank you for listening we always appreciate folks who Give us the time um, because there are a lot of shows out there and we, we appreciate each and every one of you. So have a beautiful week and we will see you next time on The Substance.